It's been over three decades since the Soviet flag came down on the Kremlin for the last time, following what most regarded as the collapse of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics and the end of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. However, despite exaggerated claims of its collapse in the early 1990s, the Communist Party is in fact alive and well in Russia today. Today we'll discuss the significant role of Russia's Communist Party and how Putin's war in Ukraine fits in with the last of the five steps for communist conquest and ultimately one world government, the semblance of revolution. You're watching a special report of Anarchy in America with Christian Gomez. The events in Ukraine point to how we are on the verge of something monumental, either the brink of nuclear war in World War III if both Russian President Vladimir Putin and Belarusian dictator Alexander Lukashenko are to be believed, or we're on the brink to the greatest push for regional and global integration since the end of World War II, if you look at the effects of this invasion into Ukraine. According to an article on Politico.eu titled, Ukraine Zelensky Ups Pressure on EU with Plea for Immediate Membership, the article read, as of March 4th, 2022, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky put the European Union on the spot on Monday, imploring the bloc to make good on expressions of support by granting his country immediate EU membership as it fights Russia's invasion. We ask the European Union for Ukraine's immediate accession via a new special procedure, he said speaking on his Telegram channel as fighting with Russian troops continued across the country. Our goal is to be together with all Europeans and most importantly to be on an equal footing. I'm sure it's fair. I'm sure it's possible. It also came the day after European President Ursula von der Leyen declared that Ukraine belonged in the EU. They are one of us and we want them in, she told the Euronews TV channel. In addition to ramping up Ukraine's membership in the European Union, the people of Sweden and Finland, which like Ukraine also shares a border with Russia, have increased their support for joining NATO for the first time. According to Eura CTIV News, in Finland and Sweden, Russian aggression in Ukraine is putting wind in the sails of those in favor of NATO membership. In Finland, a citizens' initiative calling for a referendum on NATO membership gathered the needed 50,000 signatures in four days. The initiative's organizers pointed to the need to enhance Finland's security guarantees and increase its ability to defend itself. According to the law, the initiative must now enter the parliamentary agenda. Whether the current parliament will find time to discuss it remains to be seen, and general elections will take place in April 2023. In Sweden, a survey organized on Thursday and Friday after the start of the Russian attack on Ukraine showed a slight jump in support of NATO membership. In the Swedish television survey, 41% of respondents favored joining NATO, while 35% were against it. A lot can happen in a week, and indeed it has. However, this is also a far cry from where the world was back in 2016. Think back to that year, how millions of Britons voted in favor of Brexit for their country to leave the EU. Following the historic vote, there was even talk of a possible Frankxit for France to leave the EU. That same year, Donald Trump campaigned and won the U.S. presidential election on a platform of America first, bringing opposition to globalism to the center stage of American politics for the first time. Now we see how the tide has turned in favor of regional integration or regionalism and globalism. In an article titled, How Putin Made the EU Great Again, published on February 27, 2022, by Politico.eu, the article begins... Vladimir Putin just achieved the impossible. Genuine European unity. The Russian president's unprovoked invasion of Ukraine has united Europe and the transatlantic sphere like nothing since the fall of the Berlin Wall, as even his erstwhile allies on the continent abandoned him over the weekend. From Sofia to Stockholm, Europe's internal divisions over how to react to Putin's aggression have melted away in recent days as the historic dimensions of the invasion, 
the greatest challenge to the West's security architecture in decades sank in. Another headline from the Los Angeles Times put it this way, Putin's fears of a unified, stronger Europe are fast becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. While taking all of this information, it's important that we keep it in perspective of the conspiracy or master plan for a one world government. In the book, New Lies for Old, which if you haven't read it, you really should, uh, written by Anatoly Galitsyn, perhaps the most important Soviet agent to ever defect to the West. He explains that it was in fact the Soviet Union's long range strategy to take actions that would lead the West to speed up and solidify the economic and political integration of Europe. Born in Poltava in the Ukraine in 1926, Galitsyn grew up, joined and rose through the ranks of the KGB, eventually serving in its highly secretive Department D, which was formed in January of 1959 to develop and carry out long range disinformation. However, by 1956, Galitsyn was already beginning to be disillusioned with the Soviet system and the events in Hungary that year only intensified his opposition to it, vowing to fight against it by taking what he knew to the West in order to help expose and stop their long-range plans. In New Lies for Old, he explained that while the Eastern Bloc communist parties were essentially mini carbon copies patterned after the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which oversaw and controlled all the communist parties in Eastern Europe. The communist and socialist parties in Western Europe, however, were intentionally not that way in order to give the appearance of diversion and even potential opposition. While the CPSU and KGB maintained contact with all of these Western parties on the surface, they appeared to be at odds and instead more concerned with the security and unity of Western Europe. These parties constituted what Galitsyn described as, quote, Euro-communism. The Soviets' long-range strategy was to secretly bolster Euro-communism, and they would do this in part with the eventual reunification of East and West Germany in order to lull Europe into a false sense of security. While it would look like a collapse of communism in East Germany and throughout Eastern Europe, afterwards you would see a greater rise in Euro-communism. Former Eastern European communists would switch their party affiliations, becoming socialists, social democrats, Christian democrats, and even members of other right-leaning conservative parties, and join with the communists, socialists, and social democrats of Western Europe to gradually communize the whole of Europe and, e and the European Union from within. On pages 340 of New Lies for Old, Galitsyn wrote, a broader scale liberalization in the Soviet Union and elsewhere would have an even more profound effect. Euro-communism could be revived. The pressure for united fronts between communist and socialist parties and trade unions at national and international level would be intensified. This time, the socialists might finally fall into the trap. United Front governments under strong communist influence might well come to power in France, Italy, and possibly other countries. Elsewhere, the fortunes and influence of communist parties would be much revived. The bulk of Europe might well turn to left-wing socialism, leaving only a few pockets of conservative resistance. The two aspects that all these parties would share in common is a commitment to European integration and the adoption of socialist policies with the idea being that they, the Euro-communists, would run Europe. This would in effect neutralize the continent and weaken NATO as any real threat to Moscow and the Soviet Union or Russia. Galitsyn predicted that after the harsh iron fist rule of Soviet premiers Leonid Brezhnev and Yuri Andropov, the Soviets would prop up a new, younger face to serve as a reformer, which actually came to pass in the form of Mikhail Gorbachev and his so-called perestroika reforms of liberalization in both Eastern Europe and across the USSR. This liberalization would all be perfectly and tightly planned by the KGB. In fact, in many of Gorbachev's speeches from the late 80s to 1981, Gorbachev explained that the October Revolution would continue on in the form or next stage of perestroika. Gorbachev's speeches confirmed what Galitsyn revealed, that the Soviet Union or Russia 
would transition from the one-party CPSU-run system to a democratic multi-party system. In effect, the Soviet Union Russia would become a democracy, however, all of the parties would ultimately be controlled by the communists. The aim of the Soviets, according to Galitsyn, was to take away the image of the enemy, and this desired perception was greatly aided by the formal outward dissolution of the Soviet Union or the USSR and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Following Gorbachev, this trend towards greater liberalization, openness, and democracy continued under Russian President Boris Yeltsin. However, it was President Yeltsin who appointed a former Soviet KGB agent named Vladimir Putin to be the head of the FSB, the direct successor to the KGB, and to take the reins after him as his successor in 1999. In the case of Russia today, Putin's party, United Russia, dominates control with super majorities in both the State Duma and Federation Council, the lower and upper houses of the Federal Assembly, Russia's national legislature. United Russia was founded in 2001 as an amalgamation of various political parties that merged in support of President Putin. Among the many parties that merged to form United Russia was the Communist Agrarian Party of Russia, which had previously worked together with the Communist Party of the Russian Federation in 1996 to pass a law prohibiting individuals from buying or selling land. United Russia is a firmly nationalist party sporting its own brand of Russian conservatism that harkens back to past Soviet glory. Ideologically, United Russia is collectivist and almost indistinguishable from the Communist Party. In fact, Russian defector Konstantin Przbrzezinski stated that United Russia shares the same ideas as the Communist Party. Since coming to power, Putin has also championed himself as a defender of Christianity, having bolstered the Russian Orthodox Church to prominence and taking a strong stance in the defense of traditional morality. However, this too is part of the long-range outward strategy of disinformation to make Russia and Putin seem like they are more Christian than communist in order to conceal their true colors. The merger of the various pro-Putin parties in 2001 has virtually transformed Russian so-called democracy into nothing more than a choice between Putin's Marxist United Russia and the official Communist Party of the Russian Federation. And yet, while any true opponents to Putin usually never live long, mysteriously vanish or become imprisoned for violating some bogus law, the one supposed opposition force and opposition leader to Putin that's never been banned and arrested uh, or removed from the scene, respectively, is the Communist Party of the Russian Federation and its leader, uh, General Secretary Gennady Zeganov. At the time of the ostensive collapse of the Soviet Union, Gennady Zeganov, then a member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, represented the old guard of the party that hearkened for a return to the pre-Gorbachev era reforms and more to the tradition of Andropov and Brezhnev. In 1993, he joined and became the general secretary of the then newly formed Communist Party of the Russian Federation and has led the party ever since, being the loudest voice in Russia for the reconstitution of the Soviet Union and running as Putin's main supposed opponent in the Russian presidential elections of 1996, 2000, 2008, and 2012. Interestingly, in 2011, when Joe Biden, then vice president, visited Russia, the daily Russian newspaper Komorstand reported that he met with various Russian political representatives, including Ms. Nina Ostanina, who's an elected deputy in the State Duma and a member of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. Komorstand quoted Biden as telling her, quote, When I came to the USSR in the 70s, did I ever think that I would someday support the communists and wish you victory? Joe Biden's remarks boil down to an essential endorsement for the Communist Party and its presidential candidate, Gennady Zeganov, in the then-upcoming 2012 Russian presidential election. The same man who reportedly wished the Communist Party of the Russian Federation victory now occupies the Oval Office and, and oversees America's response to Russia's invasion. Every time Zeganov ran for president, he always garnered the second most votes, 
whereas other opposition leaders have been arrested or imprisoned or banished, Zeganov and the Communist Party have not and have instead been more of an ally to Putin than one would expect from a supposed opposition leader. For example, according to the Middle East Media Research Institute, quote, it was the Communist Party that took the lead in pushing for recognition of the breakaway regions in Ukraine. Its leader, Gennady Zaganov, has employed rhetoric indistinguishable from that of Vladimir Putin with regards to Kiev and has staunchly supported the war. They're correct. It was on Monday, February 21st, when Putin first informed both French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz of his decision to recognize the, break the breakaway provinces of Donetsk and Luhansk in the Donbass region of Ukraine as sovereign independent states. Putin said at the time, I consider it necessary to take a long overdue decision to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of Donetsk People's Republic and Luhansk People's Republic. Putin's announcement came virtually one month after lawmakers from the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, led by Zaganov in the Duma, submitted a resolution urging President Putin, quote, with a request for considering the recognition of the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic as independent and sovereign states. Now, while global condemnation of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has been swift with many Western governments and millions of people across the world comparing Putin to Adolf Hitler and describing the Russian government as being fascist. Ironically, two days before the invasion, Gennady Zeganov, like Putin, accused NATO and the West of turning Ukraine into a, quote, fascist state. In his remarks before the Russian state Duma, Zeganov declared, quote, the CPRF, is convinced that the West military blackmail must get a robust answer in the shape of Russia's firm stand in defense of the civilian population of Donbass and punishment of aggressors, putting a stop to the West's actions aimed at turning Ukraine into a fascist state is emerging as the key task of the world community. Putin virtually parroted the same rhetoric of Zeganov and the Communist Party in his initial remarks televised over Russian state media on Thursday, February 24th, in which he announced his decision to carry out a quote-unquote special military operation in Ukraine. Putin said, quote, I would like to additionally emphasize the following. Focused on their own goals, the leading NATO countries are supporting the far-right nationalists and neo-Nazis in Ukraine. In this context, in accordance with Article 51, Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, with permission of Russia's Federation Council, and in execution of the treaties of friendship and mutual assistance with the Donetsk People's Republic and the Lugansk People's Republic, ratified by the Federal Assembly on February 22, I made a decision to carry out special military operation. The purpose of this operation is to protect people who for eight years now have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetrated by the Kiev regime. To this end, we will seek to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine, as well as bring to trial those who perpetrated numerous bloody crimes against civilians, including against citizens of the Russian Federation. The following day, February 25th, speaking before the State Duma, Zeganov indistinguishably declared, quote, Only demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine can ensure lasting security for the peoples of Russia, Ukraine, and the whole of Europe. We consider it important to make wide use of the methods of people diplomacy and humanitarian cooperation in protecting peace and preventing the resurgence of fascism. In Russia, fascist or Nazi is the harshest insult one can levy against their opponent. In fact, Putin's tactics not only mirror those of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, but they are virtually the same as those used by Antifa here in the United States and across the world to justify riots and violence against anyone they oppose. Of course, it's no surprise that Putin's Russia maintains close military ties to Marxist and Leninist regimes around the world, from Cuba and Venezuela and Latin America to China, North Korea and the Far East. 
As for those two republics, the so-called Donetsk People's Republic and the Luhansk People's Republic, we at the John Birch Society recognize that any state that chooses to refer to itself as being a quote-unquote People's Republic is either totalitarian communist, communist-oriented, communist-controlled, communist-backed, or at the very least, pro-communist. In fact, even the emblem of the self-proclaimed Luhansk People's Republic bears the Soviet iconography of the Red Star of Communism. Additionally, the chairman of the People's Council of a Donetsk People's Republic is a man named Volodymyr Bedoyovka, who was previously a member of the Communist Party of Ukraine and currently a member of the Communist Party of the Donetsk People's Republic. According to British journalist Luke Harding of The Guardian British newspaper, when he was in Donetsk back in 2014, he observed flags bearing the face of former Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin. Harding reported the following exchange with a local activist named Vitaly Akolov. Underneath the Stalin flag, Akolov meanwhile said he wanted a federal republic. I don't care if we end up with Kiev or Moscow. The main thing is we are on our own. Akolov said he was a lifetime member of the Communist Party. What we are seeing in Ukraine is the manifestation of what Anatoly Galitsyn thoroughly revealed in both of his books. In his first book, first published in 1984, New Lies for Old, he made well over a hundred predictions that have since come true about the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, such as the staged collapse of communism, the formation of a seemingly multi-party, socially democratic Russian state, and the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany. And on page 158 of his sequel book, The Perestroika Deception, Galitsyn wrote, when the right moment comes, the mask will be dropped and the Russians, with Chinese help, will seek to impose their system on the West on their own terms as the culmination of a 2nd October socialist revolution. Putin and Russia's motivation is clearly to restore the territorial boundaries of the Soviet Union, as evidenced by the creations of both the so-called Union State of Russia and Belarus and the Eurasian Economic Union. In an address before the Federal Assembly in 2005, Putin lamented, First and foremost, it is worth acknowledging that the demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. While speaking about the necessity of the Eurasian Economic Union at the State National Press Center of Belarus in Minsk on July 19, 2016, Gennady Zeganov said, quote, the destruction of the USSR led to the collapse of a balanced global system of world security. So the integration of the post-Soviet space is a vital necessity. The Russian communist leader further added, Therefore, in connection with the creation of a fraternal state, the Eurasian Union, we have extremely important prospects. Our task and that of future generations is to realize them. In his remarks, Zeganov insisted that unless they recreated the so-called Eurasian common space, he told those in attendance, quote, you and I in this world will serve other people's interests, referring to the United States and Europe. However, the end game for all parties involved, especially from the present war in Ukraine, is a multipolar world order as a stepping stone to a one world government. From this conflict, we can expect both the globalists and communists to further build up the United Nations and a larger, more united European Union, which former Soviet Premier Mikhail Gorbachev previously described as the new European Soviet. Rather than getting distracted with the weeds over which side is right or wrong in this conflict, it's important to keep that big picture perspective of how this all fits into the overall master plan of an east-west convergence and the establishment of a socialist one-world government or new world order. Ultimately, what may come of this in the future is Putin being replaced with another Gorbachev-style softer face of communism, perhaps even a so-called social democrat leading the Kremlin who pushes for Russia's accession into the European Union merging the EU with the Eurasian Economic Union into one massive super EU-Eurasian Union on the road to one world government. 
The thought of Russia eventually joining the EU is not as far-fetched as it may sound. On page 150 of his book, Strategic Vision, America and the Crisis of Global Power, the late Zbigniew Brzezinski, former U.S. National Security Advisor to President Jimmy Carter, and whose deep state pedigree included being a co-founder of the Trilateral Commission and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, wrote, quote, A systematically nurtured closer relationship between Russia and the Atlantic West, economically with the EU, and in security matters with NATO and with the United States more generally, could be hastened by gradual Russian acceptance of a truly independent Ukraine, which desires more urgently than Russia to be close to Europe and eventually to be a member of the European Union. Hence, the EU was wise in November 2010 to grant Ukraine access to its programs, pointing toward a formal association agreement in 2011. A Ukraine not hostile to Russia, but somewhat ahead of it in its access to the West, actually helps to encourage Russia's movement westward toward a potentially rewarding European future. The end goal for all communists and globalists is world government. To better understand the inner workings of the Kremlin's long-range plans and the big picture, we at the John Birch Society highly recommend that you get a copy and read the book New Lies for Old. Paperback copies of New Lies for Old can be purchased through shopjbs.org. In addition to reading and studying New Lies for Old, be sure to share this video to educate others not just about the key role that the Communist Party still plays in Russia, but most of all, how Russia's war in Ukraine fits in with the end game of establishing a socialist one world government. Understanding and exposing this plan will go a long way to stop it. As Robert Welch, the founder of the John Birch Study, wrote and said on numerous occasions, education is our total strategy and truth is our only weapon. To stay on top of the latest news, consider subscribing to the New American Magazine. Or better yet, we invite you to consider membership in the John Birch Society, which also comes with a TNA subscription. And you can find our many previous episodes of Anarchy in America at jbs.org. As always, stay free and God bless.